Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Fred. Good morning, everyone. So it often comes as a surprise to many people to think that about 20% of the world's cancers are caused by infectious agents. And that gives us a tremendous tool to prevent or diagnose or, or treat those cancers, an Achilles heel that we don't have for many other cancers. I should also say that these agents that cause these cancers have really been instrumental in defining the genes and the pathways that are now recognized to be common or important to so many different cancers. What's also true is that the burden of infectious disease-related cancers falls disproportionately on the developing world. And so I'd like to talk about four different things for about a half an hour each. Oh, no, no, that's all right. <laughs> um, um, so I want to talk first about pathogen-associated cancers where we know uh, where there are strategies to, to treat or prevent these cancers, and then those uh, cancers without those strategies and what we might be able to do and ask whether or not we've seen the entire landscape or whether there are other pathogen-associated cancers also. And finally, talk about specifically about cancer in the developing world. This one? This one. No? Which one? Okay. So for HPV, that's the poster child now of a successful um, uh, approach to preventing cancers. We know that HPV causes virtually all cervical cancers, 80% of anal cancers, and more than 50% of the other anogenital and oropharyngeal cancers, and that the vaccines that have been developed are highly efficacious at preventing infection. And I should say that the second generation vaccines that are uh, very uh, far along the pipeline will prevent about 90% of all of these cancers, and importantly, will prevent essentially the precancerous lesions that we in the United States spend about $6 billion trying to treat and eliminate. But it's astounding that only 58% of girls who are under the age of 18 have taken uh, one dose, with only a third of them completing the three-series uh, shot of three doses. And vaccination, instead of increasing over time, has really leveled off in 2012, which is really disappointing uh, statistic for those who are trying to get vaccination to occur. The one encouraging fact is that there has been a surge in vaccination of boys under the age of 18. Now, this is in contrast to the sorts of things we see in developing uh, the developed world in other countries, such as Europe, parts of Europe and uh, 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 Australia and Canada, where through school-based programs, between 75 and 90 percent uptake in this age group, in the younger teen age group, is being occurred. And it's something that our country really needs to think seriously about. How are we going to improve this and take advantage of what's really an important advance? Now, there's some other cancers. Okay. Doesn't want to work for me. Okay, there are other cancers for which we also have effective strategies. Hepatitis B vaccination has been around for about 25 years. Uh, in some cases, we can't actually prevent the cancer, but we can use adoptive immunotherapy. And I should say that the first clinical trial for uh, adoptive immunotherapy for Merkel cell polyomavirus to treat a rare disease called Merkel cell carcinoma uh, was undertaken last year at the Hutch. And there are other trials using immunomodulatory agents that can also uh, target these viral antigens and, and be useful in therapy. There are new antivirals to uh, treat HCV infections that may be useful in preventing progression, although that's yet to be seen. And certainly the use of antiretroviral therapy has decreased KSHV, at least in the United States. However, there, there are pathogens that we know are causing various cancers, and we don't yet have effective strategies to treat them. And I think this is really an area that's ripe for development. So there are EBV vaccines that have been tested and have been found not to be particularly useful in preventing um, infectious mononucleosis. But they might be useful in preventing Burkitt's lymphoma or other, uh, or other types of lymphoma. And there really hasn't been a systematic effort to test these vaccines in situations where they could have real benefit in the prevention or the amelioration of, uh, of these EBV-associated malignancies. 
Uh, decades ago, there were efforts to develop vaccines against the hepatitis C virus, and these have really um, uh, sputtered and uh, are not really of much interest anymore. And I think there's something that we should consider again cons because the power of developing a prophylactic vaccine is so important in preventing, in preventing malignancies. So are we seeing just the, the tip of the iceberg? Are there other potential um, pathogen-associated cancers? Well, one reason to think that this could be a possibility is that all cancers that have a known virus association increase with immunosuppression. All of the HPV-associated cancers, KSHV, the EBV-associated malignancies, they all increase with any type of immunosuppression that's given. However, there are additional cancers that also significantly increase. That is above the standard incidence rate for those cancers in non-immunosuppressed populations. These cancers go up. There's squamous cell skin cancer is certainly a major uh, cancer that goes up anywhere between 50 and 200 fold in immunosuppressed individuals. There are EBV negative lymphomas that also increase. They're cancers of the lip and, and lung cancer, melanoma. There are a number of these types of cancers. Um, and so I think the, the time is really right to investigate whether or not there are other viruses that are associated with these types of malignancies because we have the power of high throughput sequencing um, and, and viral discovery. We can use the, the TCGA data and we have sophisticated computational analysis to really allow us to address the question whether there are other cancers or other pathogens that are associated with these cancers that increase with immunosuppression. So what about cancer in the developing world? It's, it's an increasingly important problem. You, people used to think that in the developing world that people died of infectious diseases and cancer was not something that we needed to think about. But more people die each year from cancer than HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. And so cancer really is something that is an important problem for uh, the developing world. It's not only a problem of resource-rich countries, 70% of incident cancers will be identified in low and middle resource countries by 2020. And we really have unique opportunities to study cancer treatment and prevention that yield reductions in cancer's morbidity worldwide. There are many cancers that we um, don't see very many of them in the United States that are plentiful in the developing world that we can really learn a lot from. They're different and unique presentations of cancers in the developing world that teach us about the biology of cancer uh, more profoundly than we have opportunities to learn here. It's also clear that cancer has greater mortality uh, in the developing world than it does here. The slope of these lines shows you that in low-income and middle-income countries, uh, the slope is fairly shallow, indicating that the ratio of mortality to incidence, that if you get the cancers, you're more likely to die, compared to the high and middle-income companies where the, shallow, the, the slope is rather steep, indicating that mortality is reduced in these countries. So not only is the burden high, but the burden of mortality is increased. Uh, in these developing countries. Moreover, we don't really even fully understand what the burden of cancer is in the developing countries. This uh, I took from, um, from the IARC Cancer Center, and what it shows is the population of these different regions of the world that are covered by the, the population-based cancer registries. And whereas you can see that there's pretty good, great coverage in North America and Europe, there's terrible coverage in Central and South America, Asia, and Africa. So really even understanding the burden of cancer, uh, we need to develop the infrastructure to understand what the incidence of cancer is in these countries. It's not a simple problem. It's going to take many different um, components to uh, improve cancer treatment, cancer research uh, in, in the developing world. And this is a model that I take from a, an affiliation that the Hutchinson Cancer Center has with the Uganda uh, Cancer Institute, a longstanding collaboration uh, between these two institutions. And there are many core components that are necessary. We want to build up the research capacity so that we understand 
more about these pathogen-associated cancers. We need to build up training. Um, when this uh, affiliation first started, there was one oncologist for the entire population of Uganda. And through bringing uh, trainees to the Hutchinson Center, they've increased the number of oncology and ID specialists who return to the Uganda Cancer Institute. And clinical care, the standard of clinical care can be improved um, both by bringing expertise from the developed world and by training and bringing that expertise back to Uganda. And finally, none of it will work without developing the infrastructure, the administrative systems, the physical infrastructure um, to support the program growth. And as I mentioned, to develop these types of cancer registries to really allow us to understand the burden of cancer. So my uh, last points for policy are to develop strategies that will improve the uptake of the HPV vaccine, which we know will prevent uh, cancer and prevent the treatment uh, of precancerous lesions. We need to generate vaccines to other cancer-associated pathogens and identify new pathogen-associated cancers. And we need to provide the opportunities for research, training, and clinical care in developing countries. So I'll stop there. And Take any questions? <clears throat> Thanks, Denise. Questions for Denise? Uh, yeah, I have one. Um, I'm Sue Anna Brunigi with the American Society of Clinical Oncology. I was curious about your um, connection with the Uganda Cancer Institute. I mean, I know that there's a lot of concern um, in the in the international community about how the U.S. brings in international trainees and there's a brain drain from the developing world. And it sounds like in your case, you've brought the trainees in, but you've also been successful in having them return to their country? Absolutely. That's entirely the plan, to bring them in for two years and to have them return to Uganda. Would you, what, would you, uh, is there an element about your program that makes that successful? Is it a, do they have an agreement with the trainees or? Yes, How there is an agreement that? with the trainees that they will receive training and then return to their country. I, 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 no, I should say that we, we have a, a training grant and a number of us sit on the advisory committee, but the majority of the people that sit on the advisory committee are actually from Uganda. Uh, and so they're instrumental in uh, forming the policies for that training group and having gone back to the, the groundbreaking for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the cancer center, there was amazing to see these kids who'd come over, trained for uh, two years in, in uh, Seattle or back there practicing uh, at the Cancer Institute. Yes. So thank you. My name is Lois Pace. I'm with the Low Strong Foundation. I'd just like to say thank you for um, allowing this to be a part of today's presentations. The foundation's really been passionate about the issue of global cancer for a number of years. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to um, also how you're able to leverage on the ground existing global health platforms. So keeping in mind the other U.S. global health priorities, especially like PEPFAR, how maybe those can be sort of translated or borrowed right, from. Right. I think, I think PEPFAR HPV. has been very useful in, in, in providing the infrastructure that works for the setting of uh, distributing and treating with uh, distributing antiretrovirals and treatment uh, platforms that we can learn a lot from. I think also having the Gavi um, on the ground and uh, understanding how we can work with Gavi projects to facilitate vaccine uh, delivery has been extremely useful. So. Yeah, I think, you know, it would be silly to try to recreate things from zero and not take advantage of all the wonderful uh, institutions that, are, that precede us. Absolutely. Thank you. Barry, do you have a question? Um, Barry Kramer, National Cancer Institute. Um, um, to your first policy issue, of course, it's critically important to increase the um, uptake of HPV vaccination, but um, one way to improve the efficacy, um, one of the impediments to doing that is um, the number of doses, and yes. that translates into the cost um, and also convenience. And so I'd just be interested in your comments about uh, devoting research efforts to fewer doses, like two or even one dose. Right. I know there's several trials that are ongoing now. Um, uh, there's one certainly, there's two in, Can in Canada, one in Quebec and one in BC, that are addressing exactly that question, whether or not you get the same um, immune response with two doses versus three doses. It's not directly addressing efficacy because it's being tested in younger girls. But I think if you can show at least that the immune correlates are equivalent in two versus three doses, it would be 
uh, reassuring to move in that direction. I know several European countries are already, in the absence of what I think is evidence-based medicine, moving towards two doses. Um, and you know, I think so long as they provide the possibility that you could provide a third booster dose if you begin to see breakthrough infection, that it would be a reasonable approach to take. Thanks, Denise. That's Thank great. Um, the next talk uh, will be uh, presented by uh, uh, Spiro Musis. Um, Spiro will be filling in for Jeff Trent. Jeff had invited to give a talk on uh, gen genomics, but because of a family illness, was not able to be here. And so we very much appreciate you uh, pinch hitting for him, Spiro. <laughs>